China has a problem. Its groceries are too cheap. In fact, nearly everything, from milk to televisions, vacations, and clothes, are becoming more and more affordable by the day. To make matters worse, it's selling a record number of increasingly sophisticated exports to satisfied consumers around the globe. And one more thing. Its bridges are too sturdy, its high-speed trains too fast, and its airports far too clean. Now, to a New Yorker, San Franciscan, or Seattleite, with our crumbling infrastructure, diminished manufacturing, and sky-high inflation, all this may sound downright absurd. But believe it or not, all of these trends, appealing as they may sound, are actually symptoms of a much larger economic problem. One China may soon attempt to solve by launching a trade war. Sponsored by Brilliant. Learn math, science, and computer science the intuitive way with the link in the description. A Chinese worker employed by a Chinese company in a Chinese factory manufactures a bicycle. That bike is then exported to the United States, where it ends up on the shelves of a sporting goods store in Columbus, Ohio. It stands to reason that this sequence of events could only be a good thing for China. Economics 101 seems to confirm this intuition. Exports are one of the four components of GDP. More bikes, more economic growth. And in any normal country, this would be true. But China, in ways both good and bad, is not a normal country. Because of this, that bicycle has a hidden economic cost. To see why, we need to ask a simple question. Why was it produced in China and not, say, Brazil or India or Slovenia? One reason, of course, is its low cost of labor. As we know, China was, until recently, the most populous nation on Earth. Its millions upon millions of rural to urban migrants provided its factories with a steady stream of cheap workers. Another reason are subsidies. There's nothing subtle about this. With a stroke of a pen, Beijing unleashes a wave of cheap loans, tax credits, deductions, rebates, and discounts. And when it considers the industry strategic, this wave becomes more of a tsunami. As Pittsburgh knows all too well, it happened to the Chinese steel industry. As Ohio knows, it happened to Chinese solar panels. And as Detroit is about to find out, it happened, most recently, to electric vehicles. For a sense of just how massive these subsidies can be, Chinese buyers could at one point save $16,000 on a new EV, effectively a 50% discount on their $33,000 average price. The Chinese bike is cheaper than the Brazilian, Slovenian, or Indian bike in part because its factories are showered with generous government support. The party is unapologetic, indeed proud of its role as director of the Chinese economy. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Perhaps because these $16,000 subsidies, the tax credits, low interest loans, and rebates are so brazen, we miss the vastly more numerous, more subtle, and ultimately far more insidious subsidies. The ones we don't even think of as subsidies. To spot them, imagine your only goal was to decrease the cost of doing business. What things could you do, or not do, what corners could you cut, what laws could you pass to make producing bicycles cheaper? Well, for starters, you could lower the corporate tax rate by cutting down on unemployment, social security, pensions, and disability benefits. Then, what few taxes you did collect, you could spend constructing roads, bridges, ports, and pipelines for the benefit of private corporations. You could stop enforcing environmental regulations. You could ban the formation of labor unions. You could systematically exclude the most impoverished workers from public services. You could make energy and water dirt cheap. You could hand out loans with no questions asked. 
And if you were feeling really creative, you could even depreciate the currency, making your exports cheaper for foreign consumers while making imported goods more expensive for your own consumers. Follow these steps precisely and you'd end up with a country that looks a whole lot like China. Explaining all the ways labor is used and abused in the country would take up an entire video on its own, and likely will at some point. But suffice to say for now, all the above is true. If you think the American government is pro-business and anti-worker, sure, and also try smelting iron in Hebei or farming cotton in Xinjiang. Each of these things, from the under-enforced regulations to the abundance of roads on which to transport commodities, are, functionally, corporate subsidies. Now, our goal here is not to judge whether these subsidies are fair to foreign competitors, fair to impose on Chinese workers, or whether these are technically violations of free trade rules. We'll save these questions for that future video. The point, for now, is that right or wrong, all of these things lower the cost of making a bicycle. To see why this matters, let's compare that Chinese bike to, say, a bottle of French wine. Both are exports, and both grow their country's economy. But there's a crucial difference. The wine was produced in France because of its natural advantages. By converting free sunshine and superior soil into high-margin champagne, the French farmer creates profit out of thin air. This is a textbook, albeit oversimplified, example of what an economist would call comparative advantage. Whereas, the bike was produced in China thanks in large part to all those subsidies, both direct, like tax credits, and indirect, like a depreciated currency. Of course, China has advantages too. With or without subsidies, it would surely produce some fantastic tea, rice, and porcelain. But it's no coincidence that this one country produces the world's cheapest bikes, televisions, toys, and clothes. And it's not just its hourly wage. Now, you might be thinking, so what? If we're setting aside fairness, ethics, and rules, why does any of this matter? Natural or artificial, these exports have clearly made China a far richer country over the past 30 years just the same. Well, the problem, as the Peking University professor of finance Michael Pettis has repeatedly emphasized, is that these subsidies aren't free. While both the wine and bike increase their country's exports, the latter also decreases China's consumption, another component of GDP, in the process. This is that hidden cost. That's because, ultimately, Chinese workers pay for all these shortcuts, rebates, credits, and other pro-business policies. First, and most obviously, they pay in the form of lower effective wages. They work longer hours, they get paid less, and they have fewer benefits. In other words, they have less money to spend, decreasing domestic consumption. But it's much worse than it looks. Of the tiny wages Chinese workers do earn, they also can't spend as much of it. With such meager pensions, with such weak unemployment benefits, and with such difficult-to-access public health care, Chinese workers have no choice but to save for a rainy day. Americans stash away about 19% of their paychecks, the French 23%, and Canadians 24%. Chinese, on the other hand, save almost half. Rather than buy more TVs, cars, or computers, Chinese families do what anyone would do in their shoes, knowing they're on their own. Save in case they get laid off, sick, or, gasp, retire. Again, sacrificing lower consumption for higher exports was a deliberate trade-off made by Beijing. And make no mistake, it paid off handsomely. Just look at this incredible growth. There is, however, a catch. Not all growth is created equal. Being the world's factory is a great gig when you have willing and able customers. But customers aren't always able. During the Great Recession, millions of Americans were laid off, demand for goods collapsed, and Chinese factories were left sitting idle. 
nor are customers always willing. As we'll see, the United States increasingly sees a strategic interest in limiting its trade with China, even though its goods may be cheaper. Put differently, with exports it takes two to tango, whereas domestic consumption is much easier to control. And China sure does love control. By shifting its emphasis from these fluctuating, unpredictable, and politically fraught exports over to domestic consumption, China's economy would be much stronger and more resilient. None of this is rocket science. Beijing has known what it needs to do for decades. And it was well on its way to transitioning away from exports, seen declining here between about 2005 and 15, and toward consumption seen gradually rising here over that same period. Then, a pandemic happened. Americans, stuck inside with nothing to do and thousands of dollars worth of stimulus checks, indulged in some retail therapy. We bought new chairs, computers, video games, yoga mats, dumbbells, and bikes. Thus, after over a decade of slow decline, China's factories started working overtime reversing years of progress away from manufacturing. Still, surely this was only a brief diversion, a momentary setback under exceptional circumstances. Three years and many lockdowns later, Beijing opened the floodgates, very suddenly and very dramatically easing restrictions. After well over a thousand days of bottled up pressure, China finally unleashed its 1.4 billion consumers into the world. Having waited so long, surely they would spend with a vengeance, buying up property and flights, watches and iPhones like never before. Right? As we now know, the answer was a resounding no. That surge of demand simply never arrived. In fact, quite the opposite. While Chinese travelers went back to flying, they're increasingly opting for economy over business. And while its malls filled back up with shoppers, they're more often leaving empty-handed. It started becoming clear that something much more fundamental was going on. For one, China's population has begun to shrink. The flow of cheap migrant labor is depleting, and the country as a whole is rapidly growing older. Second, middle-class China's singular and once foolproof investment opportunity, housing, is finally declining in value. And that's where we're at today. Youth unemployment has reached a new high. A third of Chinese office workers say their salaries have recently fallen. And consumers are buying so little that companies from Apple to Tesla have started discounting their prices. Now, economic growth is not as important to China as it once was. You can see that clearly here. Still, factory workers need something to assemble. Construction workers need something to build. And at least some growth is needed for it to someday catch up to the US. Normally, when in doubt, Beijing channels this surplus capital into building new roads, bridges, ports, factories, and trains, formerly known as investment. That's what it did during the Great Recession, when its factories had nothing to make. But today, as you'll recall, its bridges are already sturdy enough, its high-speed trains already pretty darn fast, and its airports already about as clean as can be. Strange as this may sound, that's a real problem, because it does need somewhere to put this money. So, how can China still grow its economy? What options are left? Well, there are basically two choices. On one side of this fork in the road is the right way, but the hard way. What Beijing should do is radically restructure its economy from top to bottom replacing exports and investment with domestic consumption. It could, for example, make families feel secure spending more of their paychecks by providing more of the public welfare you'd expect from an upper-middle-income country. But this path is every bit as complicated as it sounds. It's complicated ideologically because the party is philosophically opposed to bottom-up stimulus. 
It views consumption for its own sake as wasteful and government welfare as encouraging laziness. It's complicated politically because this restructuring would shift the balance of power toward individual consumers. And it's complicated practically because China would have to orchestrate a rise in consumption with an equal and simultaneous drop in exports. This restructuring would eventually make its economy stronger and more resilient, but it would require taking huge risks in the process. Then there's the easy path, applying an economic band-aid rather than addressing the underlying disease. In this world, China could dump its surplus capacity onto global consumers, taking the cars, TVs, and solar panels it can't sell at home and shipping them overseas to Toronto, New York, and Paris. Put differently, China could simply export its problem, handing it off like a hot potato. And this, it seems, is exactly what it intends to do. As you can see, when demand for real estate started to fall around 2020, China neatly replaced it with loans to companies producing batteries, solar panels, and especially EVs. It's counting on these three industries to make up for lost growth. And since Chinese consumers aren't buying enough of them, it's hoping French, Dutch, and German consumers can fill their shoes. In other words, get ready for a sudden surge of Chinese cars in a city near you particularly if you live in Europe. China's largest EV company, BYD, recently bought this giant cargo ship for the sole purpose of shipping its cars abroad. And it plans on buying seven more over the next two years. To appreciate the number of cars we're talking about here, let's do some quick math. China has the ability to produce an estimated 40 million a year. Chinese consumers typically buy only about 20 to 25 million, indicating a potential surplus of 15 to 20 million cars. That's as much excess capacity as Americans bought in total during the highest sales year in the country's history. And China is just getting started. Of course, as you may have guessed, the Americans and Europeans aren't too keen on letting this happen. Both are already suspicious of unfair subsidized competition. And this is not just any competition. We're talking about the incredibly important automotive industry. If the world was upset by cheap Chinese steel, solar panels, and toys, imagine the backlash to a sudden avalanche of 30, 40, $50,000 Chinese cars. That puts China's economic goals on a direct collision course with US and European strategic goals. Another trade war is brewing. And as the EV competition heats up, demand for engineering, math, programming, and AI will only intensify. Fortunately, you can learn all these things and more with engaging interactive lessons from today's sponsor, Brilliant. Personally, I think the most effective way to learn is with a concrete goal in mind. Rather than learning how to code, you should have an idea for a website or an app, and then work backward. What I like about Brilliant is that it subscribes to this same philosophy. You don't just learn regression analysis, you maximize the value of an electric car. You don't just read about programming, you solve puzzles and accept challenges. It's all in service of truly understanding, not just memorizing. Brilliant has lessons on everything from probability to programming, physics, and large language models. You can freely jump around between courses that interest you, split them up into 10-minute bite-sized lessons, and track your progress toward your goals. Even better, you can try Brilliant right now completely free for 30 days just by clicking the link on screen now or in the description. That's brilliant.org slash polymatter. By using that link, you'll also get 10% off an annual premium subscription. Go pick what interests you most and start learning today.